It's not uncommon as tradespeople to sometimes have like a polarized vision of what your business is and what the potential could turn out to be. I'm not talking so much about the success of a business, but we're talking about how it might look to the general public and how it might look in comparison to other businesses out there that are not trade-based. Today's podcast, video podcast, is all about becoming award-winning business. How can you, as a tradesperson, become an award-winning business? And I'm not just talking necessarily a regional award, a state award. Like today's podcast is about a guy in the Australian Capital Territory down in Canberra who became a national small business award. He won the National Small Business Award for um, the Telstra National Business Award, which is a huge accomplishment. It can be done, guys, and this just goes to show that you know you can put your business as a tradesperson up against businesses that are not trade-related, and you can still come out on top, and it happens all the time. You've just got to have the right foundations and the right mindset behind it. In this episode, it was really interesting because we covered off on a number of things which I think you guys are going to find very interesting. First of all, education. Education is key and where you get it is not really the point, but the bottom line is you should get it somewhere. And I know I'm preaching to the converted because you're standing here watching or listening to this podcast, but it is super important, guys. The other thing I found was interesting was the conversation around being agile and being able to shift from one sort of area within in your industry or your your um, trade and move towards something a little bit different which you'll hear in this podcast Tom did he moved from sort of being more in that construction side of business and he moved more into um, the residential maintenance strata maintenance side of things um, also the other thing that I found quite interesting was uh, the focus that uh, the guest puts on reviews and always has done, even before online reviews were really a thing. And so you guys that are out there are not really doing that. Um, I think you'll get a lot out of it. And then finally, the big takeaway from this was setting your business up using systems and procedures so that it is built to scale. And when it's built to scale, you can bring staff into the business that can cost you a lot less than the traditional model of having somebody sitting in your office. So you'll see in today's guest, he has you know, three staff that are located offshore, which is a huge testament to keeping the cost down within the organization and therefore increasing the profitability of the business. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I know you will enjoy this podcast. The gentleman's on the show today is a very active member in the community, probably would have seen him pop up in conversations before. He had some extremely amazing success. I just can't, I can't, I'm so proud of this guy for what he's accomplished with the business. It's just absolutely fantastic. Um, he's a lovely guy. It's a great story. And I really look forward to uh, your feedback on it. And guys, if you have any questions around this and you're, you, if you're still not quite sure about how you, know, you could apply a strategy like this to win awards you know, such as the ones that you're going to hear today, then by all means, post them in the comments and start a conversation because you know, Tom, who's coming on the show today, is one of many guests that have won a lot of awards. And it is definitely doable. You just need to know, I suppose, where to apply yourself and how to go about doing it. Anyway, guys, I look forward to chatting to you in the community. If you're not in there, head across to the free Facebook group where the conversations all happen. Uh, you can search the site shed on Facebook and you can join the page and the group and you'll see us in there. Um, if you're seeing this come across YouTube, please, by all means, hit subscribe and hit the like button. Uh, you'll be notified of all the upcoming podcasts. Otherwise, guys, let's jump right in. Today's podcast has been proudly brought to you by Trady Web Guys. Trady Web Guys work with tradespeople only on their websites and marketing solutions to help them stand out from their competition. Everything from web design through to SEO, search engine marketing, content creation, you name it, guys. It is a customized solution for trade based organizations and it's fantastic. Head across to tradywebguys.com.au forward slash apply, fill in the form, and let's have a conversation. Giving tradies and contractors around the globe the tools to run a modern business. You're listening to Toolbox Talks from the Site Shed. Now here's your host, Matt Jones. Tom Martin, welcome to the Site Shed podcast. Thanks, Matt. Mate, as a long-time listener, it's fantastic to be able to get you on the show to talk about some of your uh, recent achievements. Thanks very much for being a being a fan over the years. No worries. Uh, it's been been good the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so we actually met. You came on Surf and Learn twenty 
18, uh, which was a load of fun in the Maldives there. And um, yeah, we got to know each other quite well. And um, I, as I was saying before, before we um, hit record, you know, I, I think one of the things I love about your attitude towards business is you're one of those guys that's very proactive with business and you don't play the victim. You know, you're always like, well, if it is to be, it's up to me kind of mentality. And I think that's really important. Like there's a lot of guys out there that go ahead and like to blame things and use them as excuses to hold them back. Whereas you're like, nah, this is the way it's going to be. And I love that. So good on you, mate. Hey, cheers. Thanks. Um, so I've agreed on the show for, for a number of reasons, but um, the thing I suppose that triggered it was the fact that you have recently won a uh, national award for small business. And that's a huge achievement. It was an award from um, Telstra Business. And for those for the listeners and viewers out there that aren't familiar, Telstra in, in Australia here is uh, a huge telecom country uh, company. So they deal with phones and internet, all that kind of stuff. And they're actually responsible for rolling out uh, the national broadband network. So it's, they're a huge, huge organization. And uh, you won the national award for small business. Like, that's crazy. You must have almost fallen off your chair, mate. We did. That it was. Um, it was a pretty, pretty uh, exciting moment for us when our name was called out. Um, I think it was 20, twenty-one thousand people entered the Telstra Business Awards this year, and we were one of four businesses to walk away with a national award. So it was. Um, it was an epic uh, moment for us, for sure. That is just incredible. And I mean, for, I suppose for the listeners and viewers out there, you know, that uh, sort of in that mindset of, well, I'm just a plumbing company. I think this is a really good lesson to you guys where, you know, you, you could be far more, you know, and like some of the smartest operators I know in business are, are, are tradespeople. So don't be of the illusion just because you run a plumbing company that, um, you know, you can never achieve anything amazing. And this is an absolute testament to that. I, I just saw that stuff on Facebook and I was like, oh, my God, if there was anyone that was going to do it, that was going to be you. So good on you, bro. That's epic. Yeah, cheers, bud. Thanks. And so I want to talk a little bit about, I suppose, today, um, your journey. And as you know, we're all about sort of casting vision and helping people put things in perspective and relating it to them. And I know, you know, I know over the years, things haven't always been, I mean, things don't automatically just become amazing. You know, it's, it's a path and it's a journey. And, you know, there's all that myth around, well, how did you succeed so quickly? But I mean, what people don't see is what goes on behind the sea, behind the scenes and the years it takes to lead up to that point. <laughs> So I think for a lot of the guys out there, you know, you may well be on that path. You may not be there yet, but it's not to say you won't get there if you if you apply the right work, the right strategy, and you you, you keep cracking. So Tom, your company's called Watertight. You're based in Canberra, which is um, yeah. three hours. Water, Watertight Canberra is Watertight the business Canberra. name. So big big difference there. So okay. uh, yeah, we've got a competitor called Watertight Group and another one. Uh, so we oh really? Yeah, we do emphasize the Watertight Canberra. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so. Well, that's interesting. And has, has that ever caused any issues? Uh, no, they're not direct competitors in the ACT, but right. they, they, they've they actually recently taken a couple of contracts down here doing uh, water mine upgrades with you know a bit of civil work, basically. And uh, yeah, so just mm. a little bit of confusion, a few few phone calls from people a bit upset with the noise and whatnot. But, but, right. You know, no, 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 nothing, nothing terrible. No. Nothing legal? So, no, 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 no. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a tricky one. I know plum, plum, I mean, obviously we, we run a digital agency and we have a lot of plumbing companies all over the place and there's so many similar names. It's ridiculous. And it's amazing, to be honest with you, how many names and like trading names get approved when there's others that are so similar. Like it's just, mm. it's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it's good, mate. So anyway, um, let's go back to the beginning, I suppose. I mean, how you grew up in Sydney, you moved down to Canberra, you were saying before, following a following a lady that that, that fizzed out, but now you're all happily married and two lovely little girls. Yeah. Yeah, so um so like like most tradies, I hated school. Um <laughs> I um I left school at sixteen and got, got straight into a plumbing apprenticeship and it was the best best thing in the world for me, um, because I, I didn't put any effort in when I was at school because I didn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I started my plumbing, I, uh, I sort of thrived. It was something that I was passionate about and something I could get behind and, and learn. So I started my apprenticeship up in Sydney, worked for a, a guy doing new houses up there and, and did incredible hours. I think uh, it's the hardest I've ever worked that first year of my apprenticeship. I think we used to do sort of 12 hour days and I was, I'd often be on the 4.20 a.m. train at Parramatta Station, thanks to <laughs> mum dropping me off. And um, wow. And uh, or, or running across the M2 with a bag of tools and an esky, and uh, and you know getting picked up by the tradesmen. 
But uh, yeah, it was yeah, def- definitely hard work back then. Uh, yeah. Didn't get paid to send over to him, but uh, but it, it sort of set my work ethic for today, I guess. And uh, you know, I've got to be thankful for that. So, yeah, yeah. And so you um you made the made the move down to Canberra and um basically never looked back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I moved moved here when I was eighteen, and yeah, now I've, I've my people put shit on Canberra all the time, and and that's fine. But you know, it's a when you live, it's a very easy place to live. I think the the average wage in Canberra is up a little bit, which when you're running a business, that's a nice nice thing. When everyone else has a little bit more money, and yeah, yeah, it's uh we've got all the services here, and we're we're pretty well funded with the government being. Mate, it's a good place. Like it's one of those places I found um, that you if, you, if you visit there on your own and you don't know where to go and you don't know what to see, it can be a bit of a drag. But if you go there with people that are from there, like you have the time of your life. Every time I've been down, I got friends, good friends that live that are from Canberra and live down there. And we, every time we go there, it's the biggest. It's such a blast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, if you know where to go, and um, if you're into your outdoors, the the bush around here is pretty good. So yeah. if you go hiking or caving or anything. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so you, um, when you moved down to Canberra, did you take a job or did you start up your company? No, so I, I moved to Canberra. I was still, I think I was a third year apprentice when I moved to Canberra. So I started with a company down here, um, Greeny and Sweeney. And, um, oh, right. And, yeah, and finished finished my trade with them and, um, and learned a lot from them. And then, yeah, fin- finished my license and then did a few more years with a different company and then went out on my own. So what was that transition like? What was the what was the penny drop moment where you thought I'm going to start a business? Uh, so, um, like I said, I, I always hated school and I was never very good at the education side of thing until I got into plumbing. Um, right. By the time I finished my my cert four in plumbing, I was doing a lot better with my studies and and that. So I, I was considering doing further study, going into engineering or something. And then uh, and then a good family friend of mine said, "Hey, no, why don't you go and do a, um, a business course?" Right. Uh, so I went to CIT and did a, a cert four in small business management and a cert four in business management, and that just set the foundations for us, I guess. Um, and we, you know, throughout that course, you're basically working on a business plan. You're doing a marketing course. You're working on your marketing plan, finance course, and so on. So basically, built the business behind the scenes, um, registered the company and everything, uh, got insurance before we actually launched, and then built built the business behind the scenes and got everything up and going. And um, and then one day, a mate of... Sorry, I've just lost you there again, Tom. Mine was walking through a, uh, a shopping centre. Our mate, now, who's actually a Sydney builder, and his Sydney plumber had just come down, looked at the job and gone, oh, shit, I've underquoted this. And he left left town and said he didn't have time for it. So we, we picked up a, um, a, a small little renovation in a, in a shopping centre. The employer I had at the time, I, I tried to get the job for him. I said, look, it's going to be a lot of work, but we can probably come to an arrangement. He goes, Tom, go and do it on your own, mate. And so we uh, we jumped at it. We, we took that job, you know, gave, gave that guy one week's notice and he, he gave us our blessings to do that. And, and then, uh, yeah, we, we started out on our own. Um, it was a job. We were doing 18 hour days um, and I, I had... I think I was 23 or 24, and so I was calling in favours from all my mates, and they were yeah. working night shifts with us on jackhammers, and and then uh, I think the longest shift I did was a 36-hour shift in a row with a you know with a couple of coffee breaks, and that was it. But we 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 met all the deadlines, and we we got through on the job, and it basically paid for the entire first year of our running costs. Um, my my wage was pretty small back then because I um yeah. I lived in a share house and didn't have many expenses, but but yeah, so we uh. We finished that job. I went went over to Switzerland for a few weeks because I uh, I needed a break because I'd worked so much. And then um, <laughs> did some ice climbing with a mate over there. And then came back and um, hit the ground running. And we've we've never looked back. Wow, what a story! Yeah, yeah it's amazing how sometimes just the just just the little thing to get you started, and then it's all off. The, I mean, I'm I imagine everyone's got a similar little thing that got them got them up and running. A little story, something like that. That's awesome, though. And so you, um, what sort of work? I mean, you started in renovations. Is that still the type of work you guys are doing? No, no. So we're, we're very, very much maintenance these days. Um, and we so we specialise in strata maintenance and, and also just your residential mum and dad maintenance. So, What was that segue like and why did you move towards that model as opposed to the um, construction side of things? Oh, look, I don't want to offend any of your listeners, Matt, but I'm not a big <laughs> fan of... Not a big fan of the builders, to be honest with you. So um, no, we, we've got a we got one uh, one really good builder that we work for, 
at the moment. Um, but we we did uh, like a lot of new businesses. You know, you, we did get stung a few times by different mm. builders that, that thought it was appropriate to not pay their trade. Uh, I've, I've always enjoyed customer service and customers and that sort of things. And, yeah. and I think in the in the maintenance game, you you know, you could be dealing with six to eight customers a day sort of thing, as opposed to uh, you know one customer for for a few weeks. So it was yeah, it was just a natural course for us. And then. We, we saw a bit of a hole in the strata maintenance area where it wasn't being done very well on the majority of properties here in Canberra. And we, we thought we could do a better job and we, we've sort of jumped in and uh, got a good reputation. I think it's tough for a lot of the builders out there. I mean, they, 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 they typically go through the same path that you, know, you and I did as plumbers. And they go and do their Cert 4 and they become builders and whatever. And then all of a sudden, they're responsible for... You know, these huge amounts of cash that are coming through, you know, for pro- building projects and then they're, you know, they've got to allocate funds and but it's it's something that you know, they've probably never done before. I mean, and as plumbers, you sort of, you know, you're the guy that submits your, your bill and you expect to get paid and whatever. But for these guys, like I can, I can only imagine the stress that a lot of them go through when they're starting out like the first time when they're responsible for these huge amounts of money and they're like, I have no idea how to manage this. So absolutely. No, I can appreciate that for sure. So I think though, like it's really interesting. You'd probably be the first person I've ever spoken to that actually went off and did a a business management course. So that's a bit of that, that that's interesting because I mean obviously you and I both know going through the apprenticeship model and doing your TAFE or well for the listeners out there in Australia, we have TAFE, which is effectively our college, a training college. Um, but there's very little in that course that educates you about how to run a business. And actually, it's one of the reasons why I started the podcast was to give people that have been down that path um, education towards things that they, you don't learn at college. Uh, but you took, you were quite proactive in going out there and um, and learning yourself, I suppose, investing in yourself to, to get that education. Um, was that beyond the beyond your colleague or friend or whoever it was telling you to go and do that course what was the rationale behind making that decision because a lot of people don't yeah uh look actually there, there was another there was two people so there was my uh my family friend who they they ran a, a good business up in sydney for many many years um and then the the other person so in canberra we actually do have to do a as part of our cert for license you do a six-month business course um, and that that business teacher also said to me back then, he goes, you know, we, we're not even scratching the surface on. This we stuff, we did know. as well. Okay, okay, right, yeah. It sucked. Right, it was terrible. It, it was awesome. I told oh. you, you how to write a business letter and how to how to yeah. write an envelope. You know, like okay, yeah, yeah. Well, it six months isn't enough, really. You know, nah. it's, um, it's it's a pretty fast subject. So yeah, look, um, no, I think I I was just keen to do a bit more, a bit more study and that sort of thing, and and I've certainly. Having done that course, I've, I've avoided a lot of mistakes that a lot of business owners make, and, and probably saved myself a few bucks along the way. And uh, yeah, yeah. What do you think? Some of the, What do you think are some of the fundamental things that you learnt throughout that course that most people wouldn't would have to learn through school of hard knocks? Well, look. Um, I mean, hang on. Finance so, look, I mean, surely just, be one of them. Absolutely, yeah. So, so just having a basic understanding of a financial statement, I guess, is is sort of the 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 first step. So, from day one, I could understand the profit and loss statement and the balance sheet, and knew how they were built together and, and that sort of thing. You, you just collect advice along the way, I guess, when you're going to these courses. Um, you're you're in a class. I think we had you know ten or twelve people in the average class, and you're sitting in that class, and most of them don't actually have an idea of what they want to do when they start their own business. They might, you know, they're thinking about a cafe or whatever. Whereas you're sitting in there and you're going, I'm going to be a plumber. So every time there's an example to be used, they go, right, let's run, let's run an example of a plumbing business. And um, and so I, I still go through my uh, my old CIT notes and, and go, oh yeah, that's a good idea. I might go and run that. And um, okay. yeah, so um, but yeah, so that uh, the, the finance, oh look, everything. You know, oh, the the other big thing I got from it was um, how important getting online reviews was going to be. So this is back, huh. I don't know, t- this is probably ten years ago now. Yeah, and, and we. We uh, went out and we started getting online reviews well before anyone else in Canberra was doing it. Um, and it certainly <laughs> it helped us stand out from the crowd back then. So, yeah. And so what do you use for that? Google? Yeah, yeah. We, we very much heavily push Google. Um, be good to start spreading it out a bit more. We, we, we do. We've got a few on Facebook and a few on a few other things. Um, but Google's, you know, Google's keen. So. It's tough with Google though, isn't it? Because without a Google account, you can't leave one. So that must eliminate a lot of people. 
who who doesn't have a Google account these days? Well, yeah. Well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> you'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the biggest thing with getting reviews is yeah, um, is trying to just just getting someone to take the five minutes. I know. I don't yeah. think I left a review for the site shed. Every time I heard you say your re- review request, I'd go, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I'd drop my job and I'd forget about it. And, you know, I think maybe two or three years later, I probably logged on and, and left you a review. But, you know, <laughs> I've got a lot of free advice between those times. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're right. It's one of those things. You've got to be so proactive with um, obtaining testimonials. And, um, I mean, even written, even written, even leaving a review where it's seemingly it's quite easy. Effectively, you can send people a link, and if they've got an account like a Google account, they can just click on a button, open the review page, hit a star, write a comment if they want. But it's just getting people to that point and making it as streamlined as possible, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's that's right. And not that- not being afraid, if like we we include it with every single invoice that goes out. There's a review request there that links them straight to our Google page. So. I guess we, we've got a level of confidence that we're doing a good job and they're not going to leave us a bad review. Um, but uh, but I do think people are more likely to leave you a good review um, mm. and get it, getting the odd bad review, as long as you've got enough good ones to, to make your star rating you know, reasonable, yeah. um, the odd bad review is you know, good because it can show your customers how you'll actually deal with the, the odd bad customer or you know, the odd. And normally you can read the review and realise the customer was a bit unreasonable. So. And I think as well, like a lot of, a lot of times... I mean, I know I've got clients in Sydney that have had issues with reviews over the years, and um, you know they'll 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 even say sometimes a lot of these platforms for reviews, people will just they'll literally sign up to leave a bad review, and <laughs> like you can approach them to to mitigate it, and you can give all the stuff. But at the end of the day, that they don't even know how to log back in and and to remove it. Uh, it can it, it can be testing, but like you say, I think. You know, if you if you if you've got good morals and you you tend to do a good job, um, you kind of mitigate the chance of you receiving bad reviews. And if you do and you handle it well, then you know I agree, it can work in your favour. Yeah, the the best the best protection against a bad review is getting lots of good ones. So, yeah. Um, the the more proactive you are at getting good ones, the the, the people that'll leave you a bad one will do it either way. The more proactive you are at getting the good ones, it'll it'll water them out. Um, there's a lot of cool. Um, strategies around where uh, we've actually taught this as well where you can you know uh, uh, after a project's been completed you can reach out to a customer and you can say hey i just wanted to know did you we're just doing like our happy check-in um calls and emails did you guys have a good experience and if they reply yes then you can send in you know a link to your google page and if they reply no you can say oh no what happened how can we fix it and you get them you know turn them back into a raving customer and then and then get a review off them so there are a few little tricks that i've learned over the years that can help help improve those there stats. is google's recently um their policy's been updated and they call that review filtering uh where you you only select customers that you know have had a good experience and so they they actually that's banned from from a google point of view i don't know yeah that they'll ever be able to prove that you you did it but it's it's put me off uh doing it because you know i, I want to keep google happy no matter what and i, I think um yeah yeah following their guidelines is, is the first step for that so. well i think it's the difference between I mean, if they're going to le- they're going to leave a review regardless, right? There's no, I don't think there's a problem with you going to the customer and seeing if if they had a good experience, and then if they did have a good experience, ask them to leave a review. I don't really see. Yeah, that. absolutely. I don't think absolutely. they're going to be up too upset about that. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a proactive approach, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, how did you? How did you start? Um, like was it was it just you you and apprentice you and a you and a friend that started the business like how, where did it where did it begin right so um yeah we uh 2010 we we re, um, registered the business and as i say we did that big job and I, I went out on my own uh pretty shortly after going out on my own I, I had a kid that was doing work experience with us for a week and and he ended up asking me for an apprenticeship didn't you know he didn't want to finish he just finished year 11 i think and so i, I put him on he, he was a funny character but anyway, so we, we ran for about 12 months, I think, or a bit over 12 months. And then, um, and then my then girlfriend, now wife, and I were, um, were talking. We, we decided to do a trip around Australia. So I found that apprentice another job. We, um, me and my wife sort of packed the business up, parked it in a van in the back of our yard and, and bought, a, bought an ex-ambulance, converted it to a camper van and travelled around <laughs> Australia for 12 months. Yeah, and then, um, and then came, came back home. Bought the um, 
you know, pulled, pulled the work van out and, uh, and we've been busy ever since. Okay. Yeah. And so where did that work come from? How did you, how did you, um, how's that played out that way? Yeah. So we, I guess we just started getting our name out there and we, um, and talking to property managers a lot, a lot was property management sort of work. Um, back then, well, it still so is right because you're strata. Yeah, well, yeah. So strata managers now we prefer the strata managers to the property managers. You you can get a few headaches from property managers, um, they're, they're, but they're they're a great way to to launch yourself into maintenance for sure. You can't yeah you can't fault them for that, but um, but you do get a lot of headaches from it. Um, so is, what's normally. the difference? So strata managers, um, you know, you, you, your large unit complexes. So you might, um, and they, they manage the entire complex, as opposed to a property manager who, you know, manages a, a single individual property. And so, you know, and a, a, unfortunately with property management, you get a lot of, you know, people that consider themselves investors. They own one rental property, and um, and they they think that, you know, paying three hundred and fifty bucks for a block drain is expensive, and they don't, you know, they just don't realise the, the cost of things today, and then that yeah. makes the property managers' life hard, and they, of course, they transfer that back to the the tradesmen. So, yeah, okay. yeah. So, and again, that's that's you know just a general outline. We, we've still got a couple of property management companies that we work with, and they're they're excellent companies, and I highly highly recommend them. And so, yeah. when you were saying you you got your, you got your name out there. Was that a case of getting in their face, like actually going out and talking to these people? Yep, cold, cold calling initially. Um, that, that was our first, our first sort of move was just going out there and, and letting everyone know that we're in business and um, and you know we came for work and and picked up quite a few good yeah control you know maintenance plans from that. Then um, then when I came back from that twelve months Australia trip, I heard about B and I. If you yep. uh, business networking international, which is a, a breakfast club that meet once a week and with you know twenty or thirty other business owners, mm-hmm. and that was that was great for us in terms of you, you don't necessarily go and get heaps of value out of it every single week, but um, but you learn how to network and you learn how to promote your own business and and um, find referrals for other businesses, which generates more work and yeah you know, and. And in saying that, our, our biggest client is a is a second or third tier referral from a BNI group. So um, wow, and they they probably account for twenty or thirty percent of our turnover. So yeah, wow, crazy. Yeah, yeah. No, I think those things are those those um, networking groups are fantastic. And I think even from like a personal development point of view, they you know you, you're forced to get up every week and say who you are, say what your business is, give you elevator pitch. And I think like for a lot of people that are not comfortable in doing that and by no means should anyone be comfortable in doing that if you've never done it. It's just a matter of like getting up there and doing it. But I mean, I know a good friend of mine here in the beaches and he, he was terrified of, of speaking to anyone bigger than a crowd of three. And now he's up there and he's speaking in front of all these people and he's just got this confidence about him. And like, it, it's amazing. That was in the space of six months. I noticed that. And I was like, who is yeah. this guy? Where did it come from? So I think there's a lot of, a lot of good things that come out of those environments. Definitely, yeah. It's definitely the per- the personal development's number one. That's you know, if you, if you go in there thinking that's your main reason for being there, then the business will follow afterwards. But if you go right. in there thinking you're going there just for the business, you're uh, you're going to get the shits on the weeks that you don't get work and um, right and and feel like you're wasting your time, especially once you start getting busy. That I mean, that, that's interesting, like that because. You know, there's a lot of conversations around getting more leads, growing your customer database, all this kind of stuff. And it's something that was made apparent to me a lot because obviously we've got lots of clients that do lots of different things. And some of them are a lot more business to business. And that way of getting in front of them and, you know, going out and meeting them and building a relationship where the business to business side of thing is is so much more powerful than, and to be fair, it, it doesn't, you can't, you can't take a business to consumer uh, marketing approach and apply it to business to business. I've just never seen it work. Yeah, well, we, I mean, so a lot, most of our work is business to consumer and we, you know, we generated a lot of that from going to these business networking groups. Yeah, and we, we still, we still get referrals today from people from that networking group that, you know, will, uh, their, their mum will need a plumber or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I've found that so much, but yeah. what, I'm, what I mean is though, you know, we're, for, a lot of companies out there that are residential maintenance and, you know, they can, you know, apply $5,000 to a Google ads budget and they'll get people calling them all the time. Whereas if your if your customer is strata partners or property managers or developers or whatever, 
you just you, you can't take that Google ad budget and apply it sure. expecting to meet those get those customers through the door. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree completely for sure. Where's the company at now in terms of um, staff and team? Yep. So we've got eight of us on the tool. Um, out of that, three three of them are apprentices. Um, the rest are tradesmen. And, uh, and we've got uh, three full-time virtual assistants that work for us. So I run another business called Virtual Trade Assistant as well, uh, which developed from a need. But basically, all of our administration work's done over in the Philippines, including answering phones and emails, customer communication, and scheduling work and that sort of stuff. And then my wife logs in. Um, we, we, one of those overseas people is a fully qualified international accountant. He worked for an Australian accounting firm doing bookkeeping. So he knows all about GST and, and he's now working with us full time. Yeah. Uh, well, me, me and one other business actually. But And then my wife just logs in and, and does the, the physical pay runs and, and does a little bit of cross-checking and just makes sure everything's kosher. Yeah. But and so how, for the team. obviously, you know, when you're, like as someone who's you did the business uh, the business management program and you you know you learn a lot about finance and that kind of thing and i know through even you know our, our relationship you've always been kind of like a system orientated kind of guy i know through basically my businesses that you, in order to run run a team that's offshore you've got to have those processes in place what was that segue like for you and how how has that affected your bottom line in terms of expenses for staff and team? You know, if you were to have that in in house or onshore, would the business be able to survive? Yeah. So um, I suppose so. Joseph's been with us for I think five or six years now. Um, he he was one of the first admin staff that we put on um, and we actually put him on when it was me and an apprentice and so that there was just physically no possible way that a, a single plumber and an apprentice can afford to have a, a full-time admin mm. person you know there um, but it was by having that support by having him there answering the phones and, and that sort of thing one it meant I didn't have to work until stupid hours at night getting paperwork done and then rush out in the morning and go and do more work it freed me up a little bit, but it also it basically gave me my backbone and allowed us to grow. Um, and so, yeah. and yeah, in, in terms of the system sort of thing, you, you're absolutely right. You have to have good systems to to be able to have them. Um, but in saying that, you you will find that your virtual team can help you can help you create your systems as well. Absolutely. Um, and so, a lot of what uh, we do at Virtual Trade Assistant, we actually, or our, our main role, the only reason you'd really go to us is we we do help you build systems and and you know, give you the technology that makes life easy to uh, to actually work with these guys overseas. So. Yeah, interesting. I think it's a really good framework as well. Like regardless of whether you want to run a business that's offshore, like having that framework behind system creation, system implementation, and having the team that's building out the systems and the po- policies, continually building on that company asset is so important. And I think, you know, even if you look at, you know, taking like a, a big business mindset and applying it to small business, that's very often one of the things that you'll be focusing on is implementing those those processes. Yep, and we, we do now. We, we've got systems in place for everything, how to clear a block drain, yep. um, you know, how to deal with a burst pipe when, you know, in a strata complex and, you know, like, a, um, so both our administrative side plus our plumbing technical side um, is all system orientated in the business. Um, and it, it does give you, it gives you a real level of freedom and, and gives your staff a level of freedom as well when they, they they can make a decision on on what they need to do on site without actually calling you. So. Right. And so where where do you – how does that work then with the team that's out there? How do they access your systems? How do they – how do you train them on how to use the systems? So we, we use a couple of different programs. So we, we've got a, a big one we use is Google Classroom. Um, so we, we moved to that maybe six months ago or so, um, and that's because Google, yeah, Google have been running this software for years, and it's it's only just become available to anyone with G Suite. Um, and you can just go in there; and it's a, it's an e-learning platform, and it's extremely easy to um, to you know to create a, an education course or an e-learning course on there. Um, and so we've basically got every single system is an education course in there, and you know a lot, a lot of them only have you know the the only question that the the staff member gets asked is I've read and, and understood this this paragraph or this this video or whatever it might be. Uh, but then we, we know who's finished what courses then, who's actually read things and they can go back and review it as well and, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. So that, that's probably the most powerful tool we're using at the moment for our systems. So how do they find then if they rock up to a job and they're like, oh, how do I 
what, what's the process for the clearing this block drain again? Where would they go to find that? I'm guessing that's not in Google. Uh, well, it, it is in Google Classroom actually, but okay. it's also in. Um, we also use ServiceMate. I'm, yep. a, I'm a massive advocate for ServiceMate, and uh, there's in, inside ServiceMate there's functionality called Knowledge. You know, you, you you can. We also have our systems repeated sort of in there. Um, and and to be honest, once the tradesman's done it once in Google Classroom, right. you're only ever going to use ServiceMate after that. And if if you put in a keyword in your in your ServiceMate job card like block drain then knowledge will automatically pick up block drain, okay, and they'll, they'll actually just have the, a button there so that the guys, if they get stuck, bang, or same with first pipe. First pipes is a good one because they're pretty difficult or technical. Um, you've, yeah. you've got to sit down and think about it. So, yeah. Brilliant. That's great. Yeah. So much in that for the listeners out there, like just having that approach to their business. It's something I think a lot of guys struggle with. And to be fair, you know, like most things, if you haven't done it before, then it is kind of daunting and, Getting it, setting it up initially is kind of like it does take time. And what people need to, I suppose, appreciate is it, it, although it does take time to set it up, the idea is that you set it up so you haven't got to keep doing it. <laughs> and I mean, I know for sure the only way that you'll ever remove yourself from doing something in your business that you don't want to do is by building out a process and training someone else on how to do it. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a shitty task. It can just be something that you're not good at. And I think that's very often the case, especially when you, know, you come from the background of, you know, swinging hammers. Um, you know, the thing you may not be very good at is, is is the account reconciling or, you know, the invoicing or whatever. And so being able to train someone on how to do that, and remove you from that part of the equation is invaluable. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely hate seeing it. Any, any task that... Um that has to be repeated should be systemized so you know if you, especially if it's something you're sitting down to do once a month or once a quarter even even once a year you know you you'd write a system and ensure the first time that system gets rolled out uh, may not go completely smoothly but you can look at it and go right what went wrong how can we fix that and how can we avoid this this issue next time and then hopefully by the second or third time you, you're sailing and you don't ever have to think about that again so and i think that's important as well like people people think it's like it is, they're always a work in progress. They're like an amendment, you know. You should always be wanting to change and improve these things. It's not. It's very unlikely that you'll create a process from the beginning and it's going to last forever that way, you know. And that correlates across yeah. everything, like from customer service through to lead generation, like technology you use, all this kind of stuff. Like things do change. Um, and I think as well, what you said before is really important. Like having the team being in a position where they can take responsibility and create an update and improve the processes. Because the reality is if you're not the one, if you've given that task to them to do and they find a better way of doing it, then that's brilliant. Like that's like music to your ears and you should never be offended by the fact that someone's found a better way to do something because the reality is that if they're doing it, they've probably got a better idea than you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so, and as you say, things do change. So, Let's jump into uh, the award side of things. Obviously, conscious of your time, I appreciate you taking the time out to speak to us. How did this event, uh, these awards come around? How did you find out about them? How did you enter them? Why did you enter them? Give us a bit of a rundown. Yeah, so um, I mean, the, the the biggest award sort of in Australian business, I think. Um, it's it's not one that you pay to enter, so you, it's only. Also, so that, which is why they get so many applicants. I guess it's it's an epic for anyone who's ever ever done it. Like you just know it's an epic application process. So you you tend to register. You you can get nominated. I think something like ninety percent of businesses don't get nominated. They self nominate, uh, which we did, and so we self nominated. And then uh, you, you go through round one, which is a short questionnaire, and they just ask you a few bits and pieces about your business. Uh, you pass that stage. Uh, you then go into what's called a deep dive into your business. Um, I, I think I wrote about 11,000 words about our business in each each different category. So, you know, you go into your finance, your, uh, your HR, your marketing, your, your, you know, your business ethics and just ab absolutely everything to do with business. They ask you quite a lot of questions and... And, um, and you go right into it, and it's it's a really, really, it's a really great way to do a proper reflection on your business, and to actually see how you're going in, in your business, and, and how things are. You know, we we made a lot of improvements by going through this process. So we we had systems that were almost implemented; they were ninety percent complete, um, and then we we spent 
you know, a tiny bit of effort got that last 10 percent complete because we wanted to write about it in our in our application process so interesting yeah so so it's not just you know if, if you went through the process and you didn't take out a um, a spot then um you, you would by no way be disappointed you, you should have still got a lot from it um, but in saying that it is it is an epic you know it will take you a long long time to do and and you, you've got to just lock away the time and and you know, get it done. So, and so, what what sort of time did it take you to, from start to finish, to create or, or to enter into that award? Ooh, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't actually tell you. It was, it was over the course of a. It was over the course of a month or okay. two. Um, but it's you know, it wasn't the only thing I was working on in those months or two. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, look, I, sorry, I couldn't couldn't even estimate that, but a lot. Uh, Wait, and, and and you said there was twenty one thousand people or businesses that entered that. Yeah, that's right. Twenty one thousand people nominated themselves into the or nominated into the award system this year. Would it that's be the, the biggest year Telstra have ever had. Would it be fair to say that um, twenty one thousand entries didn't go to the effort that you did? Absolutely, yeah. I, I imagine there's a, a huge amount that drop out um, at that that what they call the deep dive, um, just because of the effort that is required to put it in. You know, you, you a lot of people would have got halfway through that and then just got distracted with the uh, the day-to-day cog turning in their business. So why why did you decide to enter it? Uh, look, we, we, we've we always been very proud of our business and think we're, we're doing a bit to stand out there. So um, so I guess, um, you know, well, we also, we've never, until this year, until actually after we won this award, we've never done paid marketing, actually. It's, it's always been things such as this um, or you know doing our own SEO work online or getting reviews and that sort of thing so I guess I saw it in in my mind I saw it as as a way of us getting marketing and and bringing customers into the job into the business sorry and and you know and and like yeah and and I thought we had a had a half chance of winning uh, or or making it to state level We, we were stoked when we made it to so that there's two rounds basically you go through your state round which is everyone in your own state and you know you become a state finalist, and you go to the awards dinner, and then they announce the the state winners, and then all of those state winners become national finalists, and you you go down to Melbourne, and um, and then out of the national finalists, you end up with a, uh, a a national winner. So each state has you know has four four or five in each category uh, finalists. So that's that's pretty cool. You know, there's it's to to even get to that state level and get along to those dinners you can still advertise that and market it that you're a state yeah, finalist. totally you know it's still a huge achievement um so yeah so one of the questions i had was actually you, you kind of alluded to it um how do you how do you plan on using this award to the advantage of watertight canberra uh look it'll it'll go into obviously all of our marketing on our website it'll it'll create that that trust hopefully for the the customers that are thinking about using us and um it'll hopefully make us stand out as um you know pre- prevent us from needing to compete on price customers hopefully will have decided that they want to use watertight camera before they come to us or, or before they called us um and then it's just a matter of us going out there and doing the job um which i think we can do a better job when we're not out there trying to compete on price and and all of that think about all those things we just get in and do what we're good at so it's kind of um the ultimate social social proof i suppose isn't it exactly yeah you, exactly you, right so. you can make testimonials up but you sure as heck can't make that up <laughs> no exactly <laughs> right yeah, yeah it's that. and so do you um imagine that you're gonna you'll enter those awards again oh i i said to um i've said to quite a few people that just going through that application process has been such a good thing for the business. I, I like the idea of going through that application process every couple of years. Um, I yeah. certainly won't be doing it next year because uh, it, it took it out of me this year. Even though you've already got one vote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but the, um, the listeners out there, I actually voted for Tom, but I voted for the wrong year. I voted for next year, so he's already got one. It's something I would consider doing again in the future. Maybe if we if we end up in a position where we're in the next category, so we won the small and succeeding category. The next one up's uh, medium and making waves. You know, if we if we ever if we grow the business and get to that point, we we might enter that category. Um, but otherwise. I'd probably download the questions and, and complete them just as a as an exercise within my own business. Is that and let's um, face it? If you did that, you're going to enter again because it's so much effort. So. Yeah. yeah. 
And is that on the cards for you is growing the business a goal? Because I know a lot of people, that is not the goal. They'd rather, some, some of them like to stay where they're at. Some of them like to even downsize a little bit. Yep. So uh, we're, I'm extremely family orientated. I've got my two little girls at the moment and my wife. And so my, my number one goal is is not losing track of time and, and making sure I make the most of that. And I, I take every Wednesday off and spend that with my girls. And, and so that, that's my number one priority. But in saying that, I, I, you know, business is as much a hobby for me as it is a job. And I, I try and spend 50% of my time working on the business. So I think it's a natural progression. If, you, if you're spending that much time working on your business and making improvements and implementing systems, um, I think the business will, will, will continue to grow. Um, we, we're not out there to set any records on, on how fast we can grow or anything like that. But I think as, net, as time progresses, we, you know, the, the work keeps coming in, the uh, new strata plans keep coming up. And, uh, and yeah, hopefully if, if we keep doing a good job, I think it'll just be natural to grow. So. I think as well, like I think you've hit the nail on the head where you sort of said, you know, if you spend a lot of your time, and the business is set, set up in a way and there's, it almost feels like there's a, there's a culture there where, you know, systems are being created and like having that approach to business does equip it to scale if you want it to. Um, mm. So in the instance where, you know, you all of a sudden get a load of projects come through, if it's been set up to scale, then it's not a problem. But it's when you're not set up that way, when a lot of work comes through and you're like, well, we can't facilitate this now because we haven't got the right processes in place. So it sort of puts you in a position of leverage, I guess, where you can, if you decide that's something you want to do, you've, you've kind of got a uh, head start. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and a lot of it for us actually hasn't. It's been uh, customer-led. You know, we, we've had yeah. the jobs that, you know, we, we haven't been able to keep up with demand. So, yeah. so we've put on another apprentice or another tradesman and yeah, gone from there. And have you, have you had um, issues? Oh, well, I won't say issues. A lot of the conversations we have in the community are around finding staff and retaining staff. How how's that looked for Watertight Canberra? Look, we we're really blessed in that sense, and I think I even mentioned it in my speech um, when I when I won the national award. Um, in that uh, we we've never really had that, and I, I think a lot of it's to do with my approach on it. I um, I do take a lot of responsibility in that area. If something's not going smoothly or if mistakes have happened, I look at it from a systems point of view and I go, why Why has this happened? All right, let's implement some further training and that sort of thing. And I'll find we do a lot of community work. So we donate blood every um, every three months. We we do free trade days where we, we help the needy with, with plumbing and uh, and we get all the staff involved in that where they're, they're actually you know putting their arm up or, or helping out as well. Um, and I found that has just built a really good culture in the group where um, everyone... You know, they they they're mates as well as work colleagues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so look, I've been been pretty lucky in that sense, and most all of our guys, I think, have, have come through as apprentices, stayed with us. Uh, and and the biggest one of the other biggest tips I've got in that staffing front is when you're looking at putting on an apprentice, put on a mature age apprentice. You know, we've got guys who you know completed a horticultural apprenticeship, who worked on a council for ten years, completed a cabinetry apprenticeship, and these guys are coming in. They've got complete skills. You know, the, yeah. the guy who worked on the council, his first day at work, we, we went to side and we pulled out the demo saw and the jackhammer and this and that. And he goes, so what? All we've got to do is jackhammer all this. He goes, yeah. He goes, all right, no worries. Well, uh, I'll get this done for you. You Let me know when you want to come back. <laughs> and so I left him on side as a first-year apprentice, you know, first day, first-year apprentice. He was he was being really proactive and, and actually really earning me some money from day one. And, you know, the, the pittance, you, you pay them a little bit extra. Geez, they're... You know, you can charge them out. And you also, you, your customers don't question it. You know, if you had a 16-year-old yeah, digging right. a hole there for two days, they, they're going to go, oh, why am I paying this much? Whereas if you've got a 25-year-old doing it, they just, they don't question it. So. Yeah, that's a good point. I suppose there's pros and cons, isn't there? I mean, I mean, you started out as a 16-year-old apprentice, so, you know. I think mean, that's that's the reason I wouldn't put on a 16-year-old apprentice. <laughs> I think it's, I think, look at, looking back at it, mate, or, uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, mate it's true yeah. there's a there's a certain maturity level i think that comes and I, and I i said i remember saying this even you know back when i was running my plumbing company like even guys that have finished school you know like that extra couple of years they're just a little bit more mature by no means are they you know very like super mature but like those extra couple of years I mean, at 16 you're still a kid you know like i was still playing with 20 absolutely <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nah, that's all, all you're into now. I was a bit of a rat bag teenager, so I was, wasn't getting up to much good on the weekends and that sort of stuff. So, right. Yeah, no, but but you, you get those people next level again where they, they've got experience in something else. 
they've probably got a mortgage or they've got you know a, a wife or thinking about kids or whatever um you, you're just getting that next level again they're uh, they're, they're just that much more committed to your business plus they they have this next level of appreciation for the job that they've got because mm. most people won't put on a material apprentice so they they really do become loyal staff members so. most people won't put them on no i know because because of, of the extra cost um you huh. know you're looking at i think it's 21 bucks an hour or something like that for a mature age it's it's minimum wage plus industry allowance um you know as opposed to what the 11 or 12 bucks for a, a someone under 21 right um, but again you get them if, if you get them and they've already got another trade you, you're laughing Absolutely yeah laughing. yeah interesting mm. all right well this has been great um i don't want to keep you too much longer i appreciate the time you've you spent and i I suppose on behalf of everyone, I um, just want to say congratulations and mate, I love seeing the, I love seeing businesses that are progressing and growing and I, lo- I love like tracking the journey of people like yourselves. It's fantastic. Um, I think, I think a lot for a lot of viewers and the listeners out there, and I know actually, because there's a lot of feedback we get in the community, you know, they, they just want to be able to relate to someone and I, I don't think there's many more people out there that are more relatable than you. I think you're you're a great communicator and you've got a good little business down there. And I think it's you're you're a good role model for the for the industry. So good on you, mate. Very much appreciated. Cheers, Matt. Yeah, uh, can the listeners or anyone who wants to get hold of you, where where would they be able to do that? Uh, look, if you're if you're interested in virtual assistance, check out virtualtradeassistant.com.au. If you're interested in plumbing, check out watertightcanberra.com.au. Or if you want to shoot me an email, uh, do so at tom at watertightcanberra.com.au. I'm going to put links to all of that in the show notes. So for any of you guys out there that um, that uh, we're trying to scribble that down while you're driving, um, stop and um, head across to the show notes where you'll be able to get access to that. Tom, thank you very much for your time, mate. Um, once again, congratulations. And I uh, look forward to seeing the uh, future accomplishments. accomplishments. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thank you for listening to another episode of Toolbox Talks. If you're liking what you hear, then you can head across to the siteshed.com where you can join our community by signing up to our Toolbox Talks. Uh, You'll get sent a weekly notification, which is basically a highlight of everything that we've spoken about during that week, along with any other industry news that may be relevant or specific to the trades. If you're enjoying the show, you can head across to iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud where you can leave us a review. Uh, That would be fantastic, and all the reviews get read out in the show. Uh, Likewise, if you have any friends or colleagues that you think would benefit from the show and the, the episodes that we create, then please go ahead and share it with them.